So I'm going to run you through a, a sample initial evaluation of a prion disease patient. So this is someone that's going to be coming to a memory clinic because they have problems um, or changes in their memory. So the patient, again, complains of memory problems. The doctor at that time may do a physical exam. They may do some bedside memory testing, you know, the famous test uh, where you remember five items and say it back and whatnot. And then depending on what they find and how the patient answers different questions, you're going to have a, a possible list of diagnoses. In medicine, we call this a differential diagnosis. And that can include things like Alzheimer's, vitamin deficiencies, thyroid problems, depression. But what that's going to do is lead the clinician to order specific tests to narrow down that list. So they may get formal memory testing, something called neuropsychological testing. They may do blood tests to look for vitamin deficiencies. They may even do brain imaging to look for things like stroke or a tumor. But say they get a call from a loved one a couple weeks later, so-and-so is not doing well. Now, not only is she confused, she's falling. She's very imbalanced. Well, that's a syndrome. Now you have memory problems with imbalance. And that actually expands what the doctor might think is going on. So now you have to include things like, is it blood vessel disease? Do they have a stroke or inflammation of the arteries? Do they have an infection? So what that means is more tests. They might do more blood work. They might do different types of brain imaging. They may do a spinal tap because we have this thing called the blood-brain barrier, which you'll hear about this weekend, meaning that um, you can't always check for what's going on in the brain by blood alone. Sometimes you can only see that in the spinal fluid. And then basically what the physician is doing, they're trying to rule out potential causes and they look for a suggested cause on positive results of those tests. So in prion disease, we have three main tests that we use. One's called the electroencephalogram or EEG, which is basically kind of like an EKG for the brain. It's just looking at electrical activity. We have the brain MRI, and then we have the spinal tap to look at spinal fluid. So the brain MRI, or the EEG, is not really that helpful nowadays for diagnosing CJD. Not all cases will have a positive EEG, and only occasionally will be suggestive of CJD. Brain MRI is present in almost all cases if it's read by the right person, and it definitely narrows down the possibilities of what could be going on, and it may be the first thing that actually signals that it could be CJD. And then the spinal tap, very importantly, helps rule out other things, um, such as uh, infections, inflammation. Um, we do have some markers, which we'll talk about, that could be suggestive of prion disease. And we have one marker that's extremely specific, meaning it's highly likely to be prion disease if it's positive. So other terms that you're going to hear a lot um, this weekend. When it comes to diagnostic tests, we have two things that we look at. One is sensitivity or how well does the test find the disease that we're looking for. So that tends to be rather broad. Think of it as a rather wide net. And then we have specificity. How well does the test only find what you're looking for and not other diseases, right? And that tends to be more narrow. So how do our tests line up with these? Well, the EEG, as I said before, is not very sensitive. It often is not going to be positive. Um, but it is fairly specific, meaning that if you do see the characteristic waves on the EEG, it almost certainly is prion disease. The brain MRI, as I said before, most cases will be positive, not all, but many, and it's pretty specific. There's not a whole lot of other things that look like that, although there are some that need to be ruled out. And then we have a couple different spinal fluid tests. Some are very sensitive, too sensitive, meaning that almost all of them are positive. That's the beloved 1433 that we love so much at the center, are getting calls on. Um, and then uh, there's RT quick, which is extremely specific, meaning that if that's positive, you're very likely to have the disease. Now, there's a couple limitations to these. The EEG is kind of nice because there's things called epileptologists or seizure doctors that know how to read EEGs, and they're going to be present in most places. Most people know how to read an MRI, but there is a little bit of expertise in recognizing whether or not it looks like prion disease, and this is getting better. However, the problem with the spinal fluid test, which is probably the most specific marker, is the doctor have to, has to know to order it. So they have to suspect prion disease to order it, but then they also have to know that that's the test to order, they have to know where to send it, that kind of thing. 
So in the spinal fluid, we do three tests. Two of them are just markers of brain cell injury. That's 14.33, which is almost positive in every sample we get. And then there's total tell, um, which is a little bit more helpful because the higher the level, the more likely it is to be prion disease. And then we have this disease that you're going to, or this test that you're going to hear a lot about this weekend called RT Quick, which stands for real time quaking induced conversion, which actually detects the abnormal prion protein itself in the spinal fluid. So, how does RT Quick work? So, basically, we take a 96 well plate and we add normal recombinant or made in the lab prion protein, which is kind of your substrate. And then we add the sample, in our case it will be spinal fluid, presumably it has the disease causing form of prions in it, and then we add a dye called thioflavin T that will bind to fibrils that may form. We put it into a, basically a shaker that shakes intermittently for 60 hours, and it takes advantage of that prion paradigm that I showed you in the second slide. If there is an abnormal prion protein in there, it should convert the normal prion protein into itself. You get that, auto, that exponential curve of fibrils that forms the thioflavin T will bind to it. And then you see these kind of real-time phosphorescent curves that you're going to see probably a million of uh, this weekend. That's RT quick. It's really changed a lot of how we diagnose the disease. So diagnostic criteria, I'm just going to breeze through this. Basically, you either have to recognize a clinical syndrome, which includes a variety of different symptoms, and some specific tests like an EEG or the brain MRI or 1433. But really, um, RT quick is really what's kind of made the difference because now you don't need to wait for that full clinical syndrome to evolve. You just need any kind of neuropsychiatric symptom with a positive RT quick and you can make a probable diagnosis. So what that means is it really increases the uh, confidence of a diagnosis for a patient. And again, this just represents that people don't walk into your office with that full clinical syndrome of CJD. They usually come in either with visual symptoms initially or just memory symptoms, at which point you're not really gonna think about CJD. So in my opinion, diagnosing CJD has dramatically changed. So I entered the field in 2007. At that time, we had to wait for the full clinical syndrome of CJD to come about, and we only had 14.33 in EEG. Brain MRI criteria came out in 2009, which is a lot more helpful. Total tau was a little bit more helpful. And then RT Quick was added in 2018, which was very helpful because now we have a disease-specific marker that it's almost certainly going to be prion disease if it's positive. So what does this mean from my standpoint? And again, this is not from your standpoint. This is me as a clinician being stressed out whether or not I got the diagnosis right, because I don't want to harm anyone, is the kind of diagnostic scale that I created. In 2007, I was mortified of making a diagnosis of CJD because it was basically an educated guess, right? You had some markers that could be suggested, but it could be other things too and you were really nervous waiting for the autopsy to come back because you just didn't want to be wrong. It got a little bit better with the brain MRI and the total tell, but still it was very, very stressful as a clinician waiting for the autopsy to come back and make sure that you didn't make a mistake. That's really changed with RT Quick because now with RT Quick, even people who aren't an expert in the disease, it's so specific for the disease that they can feel confident in giving the diagnosis. So what that means is they're more likely to give the diagnosis, but they're also more likely to give the diagnosis earlier. So what are the main limitations for diagnosing prion disease? There's a lot of clinical variability. We heard about that in the workshop. You have to know at least something about it, right? You have to know the order to test. And uh, it has to actually be on the list of uh, uh, possible diagnoses to get the tests. And not all prion diseases are the same. So we have different types of sporadic CJD. We have genetic prion disease with different mutations that can look different clinically, have different durations, different ages of onset. Acquired prion disease can look different. So variant CJD looks very different underneath the microscope, but also clinically from sporadic CJD. So different symptoms and different illness durations. So someone may look like CJD, and then another person may not look like CJD, they may look like they have Alzheimer's disease for the first six to eight months. And Sometimes uh, not all the diagnostic tests are the same in each type of prion disease. So there are some knowledge requirements. You have to know enough to suspect the disease and know what tests to order. There is, a, as I said before, some expertise required. And 
there, I'm, not, I'm not discounting this, the clinician has to feel confident given the diagnosis. So before RT Quick, we heard just horror stories of like no one getting diagnoses, because the, mainly because the clinician didn't feel comfortable until everything else came back and everything else was rolled out. That's different now with RT Quick. People are more likely to give the diagnosis. So how early can prion disease reasonably be diagnosed? Is it possible and even reasonable to expect that it will be diagnosed at the initial evaluation. And let's think about the consequences if that were to happen. So there's very, two very important concepts in medicine. One you may have heard of, one you may have not. One is thick horses before zebras. Common things are common. Uncommon things are uncommon, right? Makes sense. And then, of course, first do no harm, right? So common and treatable diagnoses will always be considered first. They must, right? And what happens is this results in a delay in diagnosing uncommon and untreatable conditions. I don't know about you, but I want that to happen, right? If you think about your loved one going through this process, you know, retrospect is 2020, right? We, want, we knew what was going on. We wanted an earlier diagnosis. But at the time, can you imagine if they had misdiagnosed your loved one with CJD and they had some treatable inflammatory illness, right? We want to avoid that. 